and uh, we have started recording the session and my name is Laima, uh, the director of master of library information studies program here and grad dip lis program here in school of information and communication studies at ucd so very very happy to introduce this particular uh, new series um, where we actually invite our alum to come back and talk about their current job and their career and and so on so today i am very very happy to introduce mary claire o'brien who's a relatively recent um graduate yeah. and is currently um, the library and archive fellow at the national gallery of ireland so maybe mary claire you can share your screen and uh, yeah. your slides and then get going and with the housekeeping um the, the the chat and the talk more or less is around i say 15 minutes or so and then we will take questions from from the audience uh, you can pop it in the chat during during the talk and um, so we'll get started thank you very much Mary Claire thanks Lai um, so as Lai said and for anyone who's just joining in my name's Mary Claire it's coming up as Mary O'Brien I must have entered that uh, incorrectly in the registration there Mary O'Brien or Mary Claire whatever you want to call me um, and I'm a library and archives fellow in the National Gallery of Ireland um, and so before I go into detail about my role in the gallery, I wanted to give an overview, um, an introduction uh, of such to the library and archives in the National Gallery for those of you who aren't familiar with them. So uh, the library and archives is built up of five different collections. We have the art library, which has both uh, modern and rare uh, collections in it. Uh, so books, journals, auction catalogues, exhibition catalogues, those types of materials. And it has a focus on European um, and uh, further afield regions as well as Europe. Mm -hmm. The ESB Centre for the Study of Irish Art then, as you can probably tell from the title, uh, focuses solely on Irish art. So it has a library in it as well with similar types of material, um, as well as a really rich uh, Irish art archive. And you can see two uh, materials from the archive on the right hand side here, one of which is a beautiful sketchbook with preliminary designs from an artist called Gerda Frommel, and another is a letter to an artist called Roderick O'Connor. So you can see uh, from these very brief examples how our library and archives can support the research uh, about the works in our permanent collection, either on the wall or part of the collection behind the scenes. The Sir Dennis Mahan Library and Archive then is a collection of uh, library and archive materials that were donated by Sir Dennis Mahan, who was a collector and scholar um, specifically relating to Italian Baroque art. Um, and so again, this is a really helpful collection to understand that period, to understand the works he collected, some of which he donated to the gallery. Um, and it's just a really outside of artwork. It's interesting collection because his personal belongings uh, in this archive, as well as his research papers, give a snapshot into a hundred years of his life. He was alive, he was born in 1910 and lived all the way up to 2010. So we have him going through two world wars. We have a gas mask, for example, in this collection. We have his mother's beautiful feather peacock hats. There's all sorts of unusual things in this collection that you wouldn't expect. Um, so a really fabulous collection. And, um, beautiful uh, rare book collection in this of really seminal art history works, uh, such as uh, early editions of Vasari. The, the Yates Archive then is a collection of material belonging to the visual artists in the Yates family, as well as Jack Butler Yates, who you may have heard of. Uh, this collection also includes his father's preliminary drawings and correspondence, who is called John Butler Yates, his sisters, Elizabeth and Susan, and his niece, artist and designer, Anne Yates, uh, who we also have work uh, belonging to. We also have paintings uh, belonging to her in our main collection. And then finally, we have the Institutional Archive, which is the archive relating to the gallery itself. Uh, so this is a really great uh, resource for understanding the development of the gallery from the 1850s all the way up to present day. So uh, understanding decisions made, understanding the buildings, so we have building plans, uh, minute books, unusual items again, such as the gallery seal. Um, so all of these combined uh, make up, as I said, the library and archives. 
And as you can probably um, tell from what I was talking about uh, as a summary uh, on these collections, they all cover national and international development of visual arts. Uh, we have over 100,000 volumes uh, in the collection across those collections and extensive archival holdings. And these rare collections date back as far as the 1500s. So books, rare books like those uh, works in the Dennis Mahan Library, for example. This is our team. So I thought it would be useful to give you an overview of uh, how many people are in our team and their different specialties. I've kind of split the team up into four groups, but we really just work uh, across all of the collections with each other, with, as well as having our own specialties. So we have our own areas, but it's really like cross pollinated as well. Um, and there's some other UCD alum in here as well as me. Uh, so you can see Catherine here, who's a digital and collections systems librarian. Um, an archivist here, uh, Claire Duhan is fantastic. Uh, she graduated from the archive course. Uh, so and other librarians in here that would have uh, done the UCD MLIS as well. The HW Wilson Foundation Fellowship is uh, the official title for my role. And to give you an idea of what that is, um, you can see pictures of me working here in 2019 and 2020, and that my fringe didn't quite survive the pandemic. These are pre-pandemic shots. Um, but the HW Wilson Foundation has been supporting the National Gallery by uh, providing funding for these fellowships since 2014. So there's been several fellows before me uh, taking on this role. And the idea of the fellowship is to learn and gain hands-on experience in the world of art museum, library and archives. And it's a two-year role. Um, I'm just coming up to the two-year mark now, but thanks to the pandemic, which is an unusual thing to say, but because of the pandemic, uh, my role has actually been extended a bit. So there's some, some silver linings to it all. And so before the National Gallery, I uh, wanted to give you an idea of the kind of roles that I had uh, before then. I very early on in my career as well. Uh, so this is really the longest role I've had so far, but to just give you a taste of my background, I started uh, with an undergrad in fine art, uh, specialising in printmaking. This was in the Limerick School of Art and Design. Um, and during this time, I was assisted by fabulous librarians there who kind of inspired me to follow that path in library work. So I did an internship in LSAD and then also did another internship following that in the New York Academy of Art Library. And this kind of cemented the idea in my head that yes, library work is definitely for me. Um, and I rolled into the UCD MLIS um, and really learned so much. It was a fantastic course for me. I did it over two years, so I did it part time. Um, and during that time, towards the end of it, I applied for grant, a grant funded project in the National Irish Visual Arts Library. Uh, known as NIVAL. They invited me to work on an uncatalogued, unprocessed collection of archival materials. Um, and I was awarded that grant. And so I was able to work part time on that project over several months. Um, and that led on to a short library assistant role uh, with NCAD, which NIVAL uh, is part of. Um, that doesn't cover everything. During that time, there's a couple of other library roles in between there, but that's the general kind of gist of what I've been doing so far. And so, sorry, I'll just go on to the next slide, if it will let me. It's just crashing a little bit for me, sorry. There we go. So for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk specifically about my role in the National Gallery to give you an idea of my day to day and some of the projects that I've been working on. So researcher services is, of course, a big part of the job um, and I, the most important part of the job for me anyway, but that's what we're there for. We're there to support researchers um, and we have quite a range of people coming into us, even though we're quite a specialised library we see um, all types of people coming in for various reasons. The main user groups we have are students, artists, art dealers, art collectors, curators, museum professionals, educators uh, who we collaborate with a lot of time, whether it's a one-off tour to help their class understand a certain area better or whether we help uh, facilitate a module. So there's an ongoing uh, yearly module that the CSIA, so the Centre for the Study of Irish Art team, do alongside NCAD, um, which is really interesting. 
uh, there's more information about that in the article coming up actually in on Laura if you want to check that out. Um, and of course, members of the public, we're a public library, we're open to the public just as the gallery is, we're a national collection, we're part of the national collection. So anyone is welcome to uh, come to the reading rooms when they're open or contact us for research when they're not. Um, so as I was saying, we usually have people into the reading rooms, we have several different ones for uh, consultations, uh, as well as that we're receiving lots of email inquiries and helping people that might not be able to come in. Uh, such as international researchers, but we do have researchers coming from all over the world to visit our collections when they're uh, taking on quite serious research and need to see it in person. And then lately, uh, the past six months or even more than that now at this stage, we've been doing Zoom consultations or virtual reading rooms is what we like to call them. And it's basically trying to emulate the experience that you might have in a reading room and have that one on one uh, moment with one of your researchers where you can chat with them, understand what they're doing a little bit better, and in real time, maybe share screen and pull up some resources that you think might be helpful to them and, and download them and send them on, just kind of giving that more personal touch that emails might not allow. Outreach and promotion then is a huge part of uh, my job as well. I'd say I spend about as much time on this as I do speaking with researchers and helping them. Um, we give lots of talks and tours and workshops to uh, let people know about our collections to really get the word out there and to show them to people who might not be the academics coming down to the reading room. We really want to share it with the public, uh, all types of people from the public as well. Um, social media kind of ties in with this too. We're really just trying to promote the collection and get the word out there and uh, keep up to date with people's interests in terms of the collection and get feedback about what people are interested in. And then uh, in terms of staff as well, I do target displays and emails for staff. Something I didn't mention actually before in terms of researchers, we facilitate research with external QA curators and external museum professionals, but a really important group for us is our own uh, staff, is the own gallery staff. Um, so we facilitate the development of uh, exhibitions, research that goes alongside those, education programs and so on. So any research that's needed, we're there to support that and to offer um, suggestions for research materials and so on. So to kind of tie in with this, uh, one of my responsibilities is to promote uh, materials to staff, whether it be a curator or someone in the education team or conservation team. I try and put them in touch with uh, journals or certain articles that I think might be of interest to them. Even a recent email I sent out to a bunch of staff uh, was uh, related to an Italian art journal, an Italian language art journal that we recently got a subscription to. So I let all the Italian speaking staff know about this. So really, really curated emails going out just to encourage uh, staff's continued use of our collections. And uh, through email is the way, and through talks and tours is the way uh, we're doing it at the moment during the pandemic, but before that we would have on-site talks and tours specifically for staff as well as displays and I might put posters up or in the gallery and that kind of thing in the staff spaces to encourage them to come down. You'll see a couple of those in a minute. So these are our stats just to give you an idea of on the whole uh, post pandemic pre or pre pandemic during pandemic uh, on-site online uh, element of our talks and tours and how they translated from one to another. Uh, we began uh, hot and heavy in January and February 2020, uh, putting on lots of on-site talks and tours, and we regrouped a bit and figured out how to translate some of these programs and some of these talk series on in an online context. Uh, and so then we continued with these online events for the rest of the year in 2020. Um, one of them was called Collections Cafe, which was specifically for gallery staff. We sometimes put this on for the public as well, uh, called Library Late. Uh, and there's more information about that as well. I won't go into too much detail about it now, but there's more information about that in the on Laurelin article that I was talking about earlier as well that uh, is coming out in the next issue. But feel free to ask me any questions about a course at the end. Um, and this is just a little taste of the type of social media uh, output that we uh, post on the main pages of the gallery platforms. So we don't have a separate page for the library and archives, but rather, uh, we create material and send it on to our digital media team who post it on the main uh, gallery, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. 
And so we try and create campaigns that gives us a bit of structure on what type of content we want to put out. You can see uh, one of our staff picks posts here, for example, which was a campaign that I came up with for curators or other gallery staff to curate a reading list related to an exhibition that's on at the moment. And um, so we take a couple of pictures of them and the books and so on and publish that reading list. And so our researchers or the public could see what books uh, the curator used to research the exhibition or that the curator recommends for further research for your own interest about the exhibition. We also have behind the scenes campaign, which uh, I could really just do a whole talk about social media actually live if you ever need that, because <laughs> I could go on about this forever. I'll try not to spend too much time on it because there's lots to cover, but behind the very briefly behind the scenes was promoting projects that staff were working on to kind of give people insight into what we're doing. Object of a day, object of the day campaign was great when we moved uh, working from home because the staff picks and behind the scenes were very staff based. So the object of the day campaign was basically posting images of particular items within the collection to highlight them, maybe some hidden ones that people didn't know about. Um, and this way we could use pre-digitized materials to uh, continue campaigns, even though we weren't on site. And as well as campaigns, we post seasonal posts. So like Halloween, Christmas themed or special events like Heritage Week, Culture Night, National Days and promotional posts as well. These are all indirectly promotional, of course, for us, but uh, directly promoting talks by the library, exhibitions by the library and archives and so on. And then these are the types of posters I was talking about that go up around the staff areas. Um, I use Canva for all my design stuff um, and shout about it to everyone who doesn't uh, know about it because it, it's very easy to use and makes very attractive looking uh, posters that don't need too much uh, input besides changing a couple of colours, adding a few books to make it library focused uh, and so on. So I really recommend that. That's my top, that's my hot tip. Um, I produce content for our online resources and platforms as well. So uh, for the library and archive pages of the gallery website, for our own library and archives resource or uh, library and archives website, which is basically just an additional uh, website with further information about online resources and uh, subject guides and uh, one of the online resources that we subscribe to, but also that we use that are free online that we recommend. It was basically an additional tool that we developed over uh, the pandemic to be able to point people very easily in the right direction to certain things without having use of on-site materials. Um, and I am responsible for creating materials for the intranet. So it's basically like the internal way of sharing information in the gallery with other staff. Again, I was talking about how I want to promote the library and archives to the staff and uh, continue their use with all the great resources we have. So this intranet is uh, a kind of project that's in development, but hopefully will help do that too. Um, I help with training and information literacy as well. So we have loads of different online resources uh, relating to art history research that we subscribe to. And because we have so many and they're all in different places rather than a neat kind of one search function, we don't have. So we give online resource demos to show people how to use them and search tips and research tips as well. We used to do them in person, now through Zoom, like every other slide I'm telling you about. Um, but this actually, funny enough, works, I think, even better through Zoom than in person with the online resource now, not with all of our other types of uh, informational talks. But for online resources, I'm just showing them a screen in a room anyway, or a lecture theatre anyway. And uh, sometimes they're kind of leaning over people to try and see the screen. So it's actually better just to have a live uh, share and show them uh, searches that way anyway. So that's actually been a good way to do that over the pandemic um, and then we create library resource guides as well so pdfs that are developing a kind of video series uh, of guides as well at the moment i'm involved in this great uh, project called source as well which is basically a project to make the irish art archives that i was talking about a little bit earlier really available uh, to people publicly online and so this involves uh, cataloging uh, collections that haven't been cataloged 
digitizing collections and making that all that great information available on an online platform. And so my involvement in this project is digitizing this material. So you can see this beautiful scanner on the right hand side here uh, with the sketchbook that I was talking about earlier that uh, belonged to Gerda Frommel, that was created by Gerda Frommel. And another UCD alum, uh, Alicia, who is a fantastic archivist, uh, who did the archives at school as well, is, was working on this project with us previously um, and is doing some scanning here. So this involves scanning this project on my end of things, but also applying metadata to those images is something that we'll be doing soon. And we have a workflow with about 25 steps on a spreadsheet that lots of different staff are part of. Uh, that we all enter uh, data into to make sure everyone knows where we are because we're all working in tandem on these different steps. So that's a big part of the job as well. Um, and speaking of data entry, reports and admin are a big part of the role as well. And why it might not be the most exciting part compared to scanning beautiful sketchbooks, it's a really important uh, way of understanding what's going on by looking at like previous stats. Um, it's a good way of looking at all that and helping our team make decisions for uh, future projects, as well as, I guess, showing this these stats to the wider uh, gallery, to the other departments, to uh, help them understand the type of work that we're doing and to uh, prove our worth, I guess, as a department, uh, as a library and archive collection. So I've learned a lot uh, so far uh, in the two years that I've been there. Um, I think one of my main takeaways uh, that I'm thankful for is it's really varied work, as you can probably tell from all the different kind of aspects of the job I was talking about. Um, I guess that's been very intentional by my manager to make sure that I get a taste of all these different parts of the job as part of the fellowship, because it is a learning uh, role. Um, as well as it being very specific uh, collection um, relating to art and my art background certainly helps in that. Something I've realised is that all those tasks that uh, I was talking about, all those different um, projects and responsibilities within my role are all very uh, like top level tasks that any uh, library professional would be comfortable with. We have people on our team that doesn't necessarily have a background in art and they are uh, fantastic uh, assets to our team. So what I'm saying here really is if this seems like uh, a role that you'd be interested in, I wouldn't be deterred if you don't have uh, work in art libraries before, interest or background in art. Um, as long as you're interested in these areas, you'll fly it. Um, another thing I noticed kind of reflecting back on the MLIS in preparation for this talk was how much the MLIS directly relates to all these roles that I was talking about. This looks like I'm sponsored now to do <laughs> this, but I, I wasn't asked to do this. I just genuinely learned so much from the MLIS that I wanted to illustrate how it directly affects my work now, uh, like information and reference services, directly affects the research work, the research support I was talking about, uh, information uh, professionals, teacher and collaborator, links in directly with training and information literacy, Digital curation helps me with that source project I was talking about with the digitization and metadata and understanding uh, the workflow of how to make all of that uh, work really well um, and have longevity and so on. An option, another optional module I took was web publishing and this helps me uh, create uh, online resources and contribute to uh, website material and so on. While I'm not coding myself, I can understand how it all works a bit. And so I'm able to ask for certain things or know how things will look or work when I'm making them. And I have some great cataloging projects coming up relating to a rare book collection and an artist book collection that I know my cataloging work uh, and, and learning with Lie will come in great use then as well. Um, another takeaway or something that I'm really thankful for in the job was is all the challenges uh, that you face in the role and one of them I guess is adapting to the all adapting all those projects to working on site to working from home and for everyone else to be at home and how do I keep helping researchers or how do all the team keep providing great resources for researchers so I kind of covered that the whole way through but um it's a really satisfying part of the job. There's definitely drawbacks, but uh, to be able to still provide um, 
assistance to people and figuring out ways to work around this is has been really uh, enjoyable actually so that's everything from me and um, thank you so much for having me on I have my contact details there if you ever want to email me about anything if you have any questions that you didn't think of today that you want to ask but of course I'm happy to answer any questions you have now also Andy, thank you so much Mary Claire that's fantastic so I would just see if anyone has questions there uh, let's see all right so is there more information about the digitization project on the gallery website i suppose it's a very generic question there in the chat so uh, anyone that's, who a, that's a great question actually yeah yeah there it's a project that hasn't been launched yet so there isn't information about it on the gallery website yet but i would say in the coming months at least sometime this year that project will be launched officially um and they'll be screaming about it from the rafters so you'll be able to hear loads of information about that soon um, and I'd be very happy to have a follow up talk even about that project specifically in the future. And then there's another question coming in asking is the gallery concentrating more on digitization now compared to pre pandemic times. Yeah, well, it was definitely the pro this source project has been in the works for years, but I definitely feel like. Um, all the gallery understands the worth of the project now for sure. So there's definitely a lot of support and interest in it. And I think it will be continued to even outside of this specific source project. I'm sure there'll be a lot of support for digitization of other collections. As I said, that one is just relating to the Irish archive uh, and there's lots of other collections. So I'm sure it will accelerate the digitization for sure now that we understand how important um, these digitized materials are. A lot of the time I'm sending, um, you know, we're not able to put researchers in connection with materials, but when they are digitized, it has been really helpful to send copies of those on to researchers as well as we work with tour guides a lot as part of that staff group. And so it's been really helpful to send on uh, pages of sketchbooks of artists to really um, bolster up talks about particular works of artists. So, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yes, is the answer to that. Great. And then there's another question coming here. Do you get to work with many other galleries internationally? Um, we certainly collaborate with lots of different institutions, but I haven't uh, worked with another gallery uh, from a from a internationally yet. No, but I'd love to in the future. Yeah, it would be a great part of the job to do that. We, yeah. we touch base with other libraries and other museums for sure to work on certain projects, but uh, not internationally yet. Personally, I'm sure members of my team have. All right, so uh, I know that I'm conscious that we're running out of time, but that's the, another question. So what skills did you find you most needed to develop post graduation? So the, the idea basically is that, you know, you have done so much in the program, which I always said that is really giving you the very, very basic skills. You learn a lot on the job, I, I will assume. And then, and, and, you know, what kind of skills do you think after graduation that you, you need to actually get? Um, well, the things that in my role at the moment, the things that I work on the most are working at researchers, so reference services and building on that uh, and information literacy and training sessions are really part big part of my role as well. And so I guess I learned, uh, I've had the real foundation of that from the course. And then I build on that depending on the institution I'm in. But something I've really um, developed is my investigation skills for research because uh, I could be asked any question about uh, a particular artwork or artist um, and I need to investigate that a lot further. Someone might just give me a painting and be like, what's this? Who did this? I don't, I, my grandmother gave it to me and I don't know what it is. And I certainly don't know what it is either. Um, and I would have been really daunted by that before, but uh, I've learned to develop my uh, reference services skills, I guess, to really uh, be a bit of a detective and use the tools uh, to follow kind of a path on finding out about it. 
kind of have a little uh, framework of, okay, I should look for this and that and the other, and this will help me kind of build up a bit of information about this. So that's something I feel like I've developed a lot uh, in the past two years that I might have been less, less confident about before. All right. If that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mary Claire. So I suppose just to wrap up, I, I'm going to ask the, the last two questions. So the first one, what do you like most in your current position? And then the second one is, what do you don't like in your current position? I like, I kind of, I'm probably repeating myself a little bit, but definitely what I like the most is uh, working with researchers because my job is quite varied. And I, I think I, I definitely like being able to go away from the reading room desk and do a bit of uh, more desk work um, and so on. I like how varied it is, but the bit I get the most job satisfaction about is working um, and assisting researchers with whatever project they're working on. Um, uh, I just get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Um, and even when I've been doing it remotely, of course, I love doing it in person, but I've we've managed to kind of maintain that uh, offsite as well. For example, we work with a lot of tour guides, as I was saying, um, and you can get really kind of uh, not obscure questions, but questions that you're not sure immediately how to help. For example, uh, they were talking about an individual painting uh, of a priest. One tour guide came in uh, and they said, I have a 20 minute talk just on this painting, but it doesn't seem like there is lots of information readily available to me. Um, and from one line about this work, that an art critic said it looks very similar to this artist friend, but this isn't confirmed. I was able to search for the name of that artist friend in our archives, find sketches of the friend that that artist had made and send it on to the researcher for a comparison. And so then kind of working together, he was able to create this uh, really interesting talk. He had loads of other interesting points, of course, that he was making himself. Um, but I love the investigative side of the job and I love working with researchers to get them to where they need to go. Um, and then the part of the job that I don't like, <laughs> I think the very tedious part of the job, I was talking about all the reports and the admin um, and sometimes they take longer than the jobs that you want to be doing that you're really passionate about. You're doing so much paperwork and you're like, I have lots of researchers I need help right now, but I'm doing this. And so sometimes I can really get bogged down in like all that data entry, but it can be, it's so useful that when I start creating reports and I start analyzing, uh, you know, highs and lows of usages of like online resources or uh, attendance to the reading room and stuff like that, I realize, okay, this is why I'm, this is why it's so important because it helps us have a much better perspective of what we're doing and what we can do better in the future and that kind of thing but it's definitely tedious anyway. Thank you so much, Mary Claire. This is so fantastic. And really thank you again to come in and talk to our students and our alums. And um, so um, we, we give a virtual round of applause. <laughs> thank you everyone. <laughs> thank I'm you really so excited much. for the rest of the series. I can't wait to hear um, yeah. all the other library professionals talk yeah. about their roles. Absolutely.